I think one of the first things I need to say is it's fantastic to actually see court holding a parent and a doctor meeting. I think this is absolutely <coughs> a fantastic way forward. I think it's been a long time coming, but I think court has actually made a huge stride in making pseudo obstruction in both adults and, ch and children, bringing it to the fore, and, and I think making us think a bit more about it. Um, normally, if I'm, I'm talking about pseudo obstruction, um, <coughs> Barry provides me with a bottle of wine, but today, unfortunately, he <laughs> hasn't. So I have to wing it, wing it solo. For a, long, for a long time, I've been interested in children with intestinal pseudo obstruction or children who needed intensive nutritional support. And it's been a journey, and I think I'm old enough now to say that I was one of the <coughs> first groups to look at home PN in children. And it was quite a scary um, adventure for us because very little was known. And I think now, Cassim's right, I think in research and the way forward with dissemination of research has actually brought things through to a, to a fore. And this is one of the sorts of things that we're going to talk about. This, I'm going to go through some of the highlights that we as a paediatrician have a slight difference and have a slight problem um, with adults, but having worked now and having to try and bring things forward as a combined children adult unit has been extremely helpful because a lot of the things that we know have been extrapolated from the things that Cassie has found. Well, if you're looking at paedi paediatrics, it's very difficult to do a lot of research on children from ethical points of view. So it's much better if it's guided and targeted so that we know exactly what we're looking at. This is the sort of thing, this is a, a girl who um, presented at birth and was probably quite slow in being picked up and at about the age of eight months the penny dropped and this child actually had pseudo obstruction and has been on TPN ever since. That's part of the problem, it's often not thought of and it's often thought of late. This is another sort of thing that we're now seeing more and more of. And this is a girl who's had minor problems all the way through the ten, first 10 years of her life. And then suddenly things, as she approaches puberty, goes completely wrong. And starts to have increasing abdominal symptoms and progresses. And in, in fact, this child um, is actually on TPN as well. And was normal right the way through until the age of 12. And then something happened. And she, and she deteriorated. This is something that we're seeing increasingly now, and again, something that we're trying to get a handle on. So, why paediatrics? Paediatrics is one of those sort of um, specialties where it changes with age. And as a paediatrician, you have to think of things that occur in the age group in which you're seeing. So, we tend to split it into neonates, children, and adolescents. And each of these will have different presentations and different management problems. Obviously, as you get younger and you present with pseudo-obstruction, you've then got a lifetime of a chronic debilitating disease and the support that's needed. That's devastating for both a child and a family. And I think the support needs to be provided right away at the beginning. So neonates are very, very difficult. We also have to provide adequate nutrition and support to get that child to grow, to become an, an adolescent, to become an adult. And I have to say that over the years we have had um, children, I think the youngest uh, we had was five who had a massive, wasn't a pseudo obstruction, she had massive gut loss gut loss and is now in her 30s. So we're now beginning to see children who have come through and have, have, have reached adult life, which is reassuring and it's, it's encouraging. You can pick it up antenatally, um, not with any, any certainty, but you can get hints. Unfortunately, they're hints, and they're hints that don't really, um, are often misinterpreted and don't point to the right direction of God kind of the point of it, never mind. So an ultrasound, most, most women now go for an antenatal ultrasound. 
in some of the genetic congenital uh, pseudo-obstructive problems, you can spot it on an ultrasound. You can see that because the gut has never worked. So you get dilated loops of gut. And in some of them, which is associated with um, particularly some problems of smooth muscle, you also get dilatation of the renal tract as well. Unfortunately, you will also see the, thing, the same sort of picture in intestinal obstruction. So it points to obstruction, but it doesn't tell you whether it's surgical or if it's a pseudo-obstruction. But often the clues are there antenatally if you go back and look. So what are we looking for antenatally? What are we looking for in the neonate, the newborn baby who has a problem with, we think, pseudo-obstruction? As Andy said, these are devastating. It's a devastating age group to deal with because they have a very high mortality. And we're looking at problems. This is a full stateless specimen of the, of the gut. And unfortunately, I haven't got a pointer, but I could go through here. That's the inside muscle, and you get nerve going through this. So any bit of this can be disordered genetically. So you can have problems with muscle. So smooth muscle can be quite markedly um, interfered with so that there's no propulsion of gut. And that, again, involves the kidney. So you would get associated renal problems. The nerves will be co uh, coordinating a uh, propulsive um, impulse going through. And they can be absent or disordered at birth. Occasionally, you see infiltration of inflammatory um, reactions within the nerves themselves. That's rare. It usually occurs later. But you can have a congenital problem with the nerves, and the classic, I suppose, would be something like Hirschsprungs. I don't know if you know about Hirschsprungs. Hirschsprungs is mainly around the lower bowel, where the, the well, it is just below the lower bowel, where the nerves are discoordinate and cause a constriction. And these babies are born with horrendous constipation, but it can be extended all the way up the gut, and that would be a classic example of where the nerves and the ganglia in the nerves are disordered. Joe Martin is um, here is very interested in connect connective tissue, as in um, uh, connective tissue disorders. Not really much of a congenital problem, but also looking at so there are cells called cells of the jar, which are cells that actually coordinate movement through gut. And for a long time, we've been interested into whether that causes a problem uh, causes a problem at birth. So you get discordant movement through the gut, creating pseudo obstruction. The problem with the diagnosis of this is, as you spot, when we do jejunal biopsies, most kids with chronic diarrhea, constipation, will get a mucosal biopsy. So you go in and you take a grab and come out. It tells you nothing about that. The only way you can do that is to do a full thickness specimen go and take a full thickness uh, sample from the bowel. Um, that's a major undertaking in a neonate and young baby, but occasionally you have to. We've talked about laparoscopic surgery, and again, laparoscopic surgery is possible, but occasionally you make the diagnosis and you find that the gut just packs up and the child that's been chugging along suddenly gets horrendous problems because you've done a full thickness biopsy and ends up with a pseudo, complete pseudo obstruction for a while. And that's happened to us on a couple of occasions. So we do it, we consider it, but we do it with caution, and we normally do it if we're going to do another surgical procedure. I have to say that very often we don't see anything on a full thickness biopsy. So very often we don't make a firm diagnosis on a full thickness biopsy. And this is one of the problems. It's a multifactorial disease. It's lots of causes causing this. And, multiple, and a stab through a full thickness biopsy will pick up muscle, nerve, and perhaps connective tissue, but will not pick up anything more subtle. And I think I want to come on to that when we talk about the future in paediatrics. This is one of the problems we face. This is a young child, bang. Being perfectly well suddenly presents in a DGH hospital 
with this massive distortion. It's um, no, it's it's a nightmare, and it's not un it's not un unsurprising that most surgeons will think of that as a mechanical obstruction and go in and do a laparotomy. In, in, they may be right, but you, this is something that you do see. This sort of gross distension has a laparotomy. Unfortunately, um, if you're if you're done as an emergency, <coughs> you often don't get a full thickness biopsy taken at the same time. So the diagnosis is delayed, but you've had your first surgery. And that's something that um, we are very aware of, and it's a very real problem, but it's nothing that it's very difficult to get a, a, um, around that as a problem. Occasionally we see a surprise. This is a child who had reflux, and we see lots of kids with reflux, babies vomit. And we, in some situations, if if the reflux doesn't appear to be settling or is progressive and the child's losing weight, we will do a barium enema. And I don't know that you can actually see this, but it's thumped on the wrong side. This is a malrotation. When you're actually in utero, all your gut sits out in the breeze for a while <coughs> and then goes back. And it goes back in a very specific pattern. So the stomach sits here and the cecum down here, and the bands that attach the mesentery go from there. In some situations, it's, it's here, this is gross. Often it's just the, the small intestine that doesn't cross. But you get a malrotation. And very often that malrotation is, asso is associated with dysmotility of the bowel. So instead of going back in a normal pattern, it's gone back grandly because the coordination or the movement Hasn't been, um, hasn't been there to decide which way to go. So this child actually then progressed on to quite marked intestinal dysmotility. Uh, it was picked up mainly because it was, it was reflux and had a period. So in neonates or newborns, the, the, the symptoms and signs of impending gastrointestinal dysmotility are very, very subtle. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, so not just vomiting but having problems and losing weight, is extremely common. And we treat and we do a, um, and we and we treat medically and we'd hope to get it under control by the age of about a year. Poor feeding is another problem. All of these are very common problems presenting to a general pediatrician. Likewise constipation. So constipation um, poor feeding, the gastroesophageal reflux, are often the very subtle first signs of intestinal dysmotility. And I think it's important that if these are not responding to um, conventional treatments, then it should raise our suspicion a little higher. One of the problems that we face with the neonates, if you have the investigations, I have to say, are exactly the same as Andy was talking about to apart from the pill, and thanks to port, we also have a paediatric manometer that we can actually look at in babies as well, or children as well. So this sort of thing can actually be extended down from adults into children, so we can look at intestinal motility and bowel motility in newborn babies right way through to adults. <coughs> the problem that they face is nutrition. I said they've got to grow, they've got to become an adult, they've got to go through puberty and adolescence. So the nutrition support becomes crucial. So we have two ways in which we can deal with that. Either if the child's vomiting a lot, to put the, uh, to put the feeding tube through the stomach into the jejunum to try and get high calorie feed to, the tube to support the child. We then find because of the small bowel motility, which is poor, you get bacterial overgrowth, which is complicated in fact. So this often requires a lot of fluid to try and lift, give high calories to get the baby to grow. And very often we have to, we have to combine that with um, parental nutrition, total parental nutrition, or partial parental nutrition. The sting in the tail of that is that in this particular age group, TPN 
if um, coupled with bacterial overgrowth, sepsis, Lyme sepsis is associated with liver disease. Babies and infants are very prone to cholestatic liver disease or liver disease associated TPA. And that is a disaster in the process because we then have to treat both the liver disease and the gut disease. And this is an area where, again, it may be a, a progression to transplantation simply because we've had to use high dose TPN and we've, we've created a, a, a liver disease in this situation. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, I'm losing my voice a bit. This is a registry of, from Europe, looking at children requiring transplantation and TPN. So, volvulus is where um, the mal rotation has twisted and the whole of the blood supply has been um, uh, stopped to the, to the uh, small intestine. That's disaster because you're left with a very short period of blood. This is a common problem associated with prematurity. <coughs> this is intestinal atresia, so these are congenital blocks in the intestine. But what I wanted to raise was the, the incidence of pseudo-obstruction and dysmotivity. They represent quite a high group of people who are moving forward to transplant in Europe. So this, before when we were we we had we didn't have much in the way of data, we were unaware of chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction in children. It's coming up to the fore. It's, we're now recognising it as being a significant problem in children. This is another. This is going to the other extreme, and this is something that. Um, I was seeing a lot of, and one of the beauties of being able to do combined clinics with Cassim is you can actually join things up a bit. So he and I are seeing the, I, I see the ones that are just heading towards Cassim. So we're looking at an older type of child, and this is someone, this is the type of problem that we're now facing increasingly. And this is Erlos Danlos, this is connective tissue disorder problems. And this is devastating because we are seeing it in children who are. Uh, probably 12, 13, 14, and as, just as they're getting into their teens and their exam years. And they're presenting to us with gastrointestinal problems. And retrospectively, if you go back in the history, they have had significant degrees of reflux, they've had problems feeling full, they've had problems with constipation. But the minute they seem to hit this early teenage life, things go completely awry and they present with nausea, vomiting, unable to take enough volume in to be able to, to, to grow. So they're losing weight, they're miserable, they're in pain, they have horrendous abdominal pain and marked weight loss. And this is a group that we are seeing increasingly. And I have to say it's more common in, in girls and I have um, about 10 years ago we were seeing probably the same group who were presenting and they would present to us for motility studies query anorexia university same group but now we're, we're, on, we're, we're looking at them in a more um, multifactorial way and we're becoming much more aware of the relevance of urban standards this as you're aware is a multi-system multi problem so the gastroparesis, the, paralyze, the, the poor movement of the stomach and the constipation presents with us, but they have other problems. They have mast cell degranulation, they have muscle pains, and they also can progress. And we have um, three currently going through on total parental nutrition. And to muddy the waters a little bit, we've now got four children with Los Danos, who presented at the age of two. So we seem to be coming, now, now we're looking at it in a bit more detail, we seem to have a two-peak prong on our pseudo-obstruction, but two-peak prong on the EDS side of things as well. We're getting a group who are born very early with catastrophic presentations, who have poor um, small bowel motility, 
who are TPM. And then we have another group who are reaching us in their early teens and are progressing from their teens. This is something that we need to look at. This is a group, this is something new, and it's something that's quite important because obviously, if you're going to present that early, you're going to cause a problem. Likewise, can we, by intervening early in this group, prevent the early teens progressing into more intensive nutritional support, such as TPN? Just a little bit about management, because I think one of the things that's happened nationally is that there's been a bit of confusion about how we're going to manage intestinal pseudo obstruction. Because I have to say, that for years, it's been very um, ad hoc and um, piecemeal. And as a society, we there's a society of pediatric gastroenterology, nutrition, and hepatology, and we are trying to look at a way that we can get a better handle on a disease that's very rare. So we need to look to get as much information as we can on what's going on. And one of the suggestions, and I think it's now um, appropriate, is that for infants and babies, they will go to the, the service at Great Ormond Street. And the reason for that is that they will then be investigated for genetics, immuno, um, uh, immuno, immunology, and um, a, a formal study of their mobility. And from there, we hope to gain data on all the children in the UK. So it's the same sort of principle of looking at research and expand, expanding that into service. And I think that's very sensible. So this is really to get a handle on how things are going. Management is outside, but I think one of the problems that we face at the moment <coughs> is the management and the day-to-day -day management of pseudo instruction is a bit haphazard and I think we need to broaden our education amongst our paediatricians, our general paediatricians, as to how we should be managing this. Certainly one thing that we're trying to do <coughs> is to form networks. So <coughs> if you're in a DGH hospital with one of, one of our children, then we have a network so that we can actually talk to each other with terms of the management. So hopefully that will happen. So this sort of centralisation, if you like, is to look at epidemiology and etiology. I think Nick Nichols going to talk a bit about that. With the, oops, sorry. The whole thing's been back. We've, we've talked about adults and now we've gone to Chilkins. In our own service, we've centralised our GI physiology. We've, we've, for a long time, we've been um, working and been very reliant on the auspices and the kind support from the adult service, but over the last four years we've moved to a paediatric GI physiology service, coupled with both Cassian and Daniel Sifrin, who is upper GI physiology, professor of upper GI physiology. And that seems to be working extremely well. It was pumped primed, and I have a little plug for board, it was pumped primed by the GI physiology piece. So we were able to get a designated paediatric nurse to support the service. So now all investigations can be centralised and can be um, <coughs> carried out in paediatric motility. And the advantage of that, of course, is that we are now able to um, combine our routine monitoring and routine measurements into more sensible research. And over the last two months, we've acquired a research fellow as well. So things are moving forward, things are moving forward, but things like your, your money helps to pump prime that sort of thing, so it's given that a boost up. So thank you very much, Paul. That's, I think, the presentation from a few people who you may recognize. And Lucy was the first of the GI physiology nurses. She's now um, working in Dublin. I think Sonia was quite an unimpressed with the laboratory. <laughs> so what about EDS? Because I think this is an area that has caused a huge concern. And I think a lot of people are worried that they're going to be dropped. Because it, it's, it, it's something that is, requires a multidisciplinary service because of the association. 
and it does mean that there's a lot of disjointed care amongst the London group and we hope in the next couple of months to meet up to form a pan-London paediatric group to get some sensible um, way to look, for, look to management and investigation of the, uh, the, the ad adolescents with EDS. I'll leave you with Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to take... Daniel looks a little quizzical. <laughs> Sorry? And I'm happy to. Well, I'm happy to stay behind for the rest. Questions.